Yeah, the uh, the breed originally, my name is Mark Riesinger, and the breed originally started in uh, in my mind in the 70s. I was training Dodge. Yeah. I-59 was 223rd. Dodge with him with K-9. Uh, we had accounts and with, uh, uh, we trained attack dogs. We did a lot of obedience, search and find. Uh, we did all types of training there. And um, the Rottweiler just came on the set here in America. It was 1975. And uh, I liked the Rottweiler. I liked their size and I liked uh, their biting ability, but I, I liked the temperament of the German Shepherd more. Uh, the mm -hmm. Shepherd old. And um, so to think outside of the box back then, uh, really unusual. People weren't breeding this to that. Like today, you know, they people get creative and they breed a poodle to a schnauzer and call it a strudel. And, you know, back then that was called a mutt. And that was it. People didn't, you know, they... They'd say, oh, that, that dog's worthless. So when I started thinking outside of the box, people would would say to me, uh, well, aren't there enough good breeds that you could choose from that you could, you know? And I said, no, they're really not. What I'm trying to achieve with a dog, I want a dog that doesn't have as high of a prey drive as a shepherd, but I want the defense drive, and I want more defense drive. Um, I want a dog that's going to be a personal companion to people first and foremost, and a dog that's going to uh, be willing to put its very life on the line for its family. I want a dog that distrusts adult males, that can that can tell when there's a threat. Um, and I want this inherent in the breed. I don't want to have to train this into the dog. And so uh, my whole life, I had been a lover of dogs. I mean, that was my passion since I was a child. Most of my book reports were done on dogs, and um, my mom wouldn't let me have a dog, so that even made it more. I wanted it, I, I wanted it that much more, and uh, that being the case, I uh, I uh, read everything I could, every breed, and uh, any chance I got to go to a dog show, I went. I worked for a kennel as a child. I worked for a kennel cleaning up. Uh, a kennel owned by a, uh, a lady who had the top Kerry Blue Terrier. I also worked for Martin Dusage, who was a uh, breeder of American Terriers, and his uh, dog, Caesar, figures into quite a few of the greats of today. You look back mm -hmm. in the pedigree. And so I had as much experience as I could get, and I worked for a veterinarian uh, for a couple of years, Dr. Jesse Allen Jones prior to being at Shashi Kennel and Canine. And um, so I started putting this together and I would talk to different people about it, different people that I worked with at different kennels that I'd worked with and different dog men and dog women that I knew. And, and I knew they loved the breed. And, and so uh, uh, I put this breeding program together and Dr. Jones introduced me to a geneticist and um, uh, we spoke, and uh, and she said she would be more than happy to help me at, uh, you know, at whatever capacity she could help. And she was at uh, UC Davis, and um, that's where everything began. I started, uh, you know, uh, phenotyping the dogs, and I put the breeding program together on paper, and then I started going out talking to different people that owned uh, different breeds, like with the English Mastiff. I had to sign paperwork stating that I would not divulge the name of the person that owned the dog or the dog because it was a show dog and they didn't really have problems with that uh, American Kennel Club. And uh, like I said, this was, you know, it was 30 years, 35 years ago. This was a absolute no, no. They were doing right. right. So um, I did that and uh, we brought over some dogs from uh, Europe some uh, Neapolitan Mastiff. Um, I was fortunate in that I had uh, some family over there that were able to help me out. Uh, and uh, spent a great deal of money putting together the F1 breeding stock. And um, once I got that F1 breeding stock, 
all together, and then I made my move. We stored uh, semen in the cryogenics bank, and um, we have, then I had to recreate the entire breeding program with different dogs, same breed, but different specimens, because I wanted to widen the gene pool. Mm -hmm. And it again. And again, we used cryogenics bank and stored semen. And then we did it a third time. Now, by now, we had our F1s on the ground. And when I did it the third time, then I began to do what I call a weave. And it was the loose line breeding program where the sire of the sire is the same as the grandsire of the dam on the dam side. And the, the dog breeders don't understand that. And the rest of the people don't figure it out. Um, but basically what I wanted to do was I wanted to create a dog that was a loving companion to its family. And um, I wanted to know that I had a dog that was uh, never going to back up from trouble. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. What came at it, the dog was going to know what to do and it was going to spring the action and, and do what it needed to do to protect its family. So uh, we used specimens at 18 months. We had dogs x-rayed, hips, elbows, had their eyes checked. Uh, when they were babies, little eight, 10-week-old pups were running them through mazes, opening umbrellas, doing what we could to see if they were skittish or what their temperaments were. And um, certain dogs were, certain dogs weren't. And uh, so... It was really a selective breeding program where we used the best to the best, and we continued to do that generation after generation after generation after generation. So that what we have today um, is better than what we had in the beginning. Sometimes people mm -hmm. get a hold of a breed and they destroy it overnight. Um, I've kept a real close watch on this breed, and for the first six generations, People couldn't buy a dog without being involved in the breeding program on contract. And this, because of that, we have dogs like Rhino. We have dogs that have right temperament. And, uh, you know, they're, they're beautiful dogs to look at. And they're also, uh, you know, protective by nature, very loving with their family and the people that their family uh, accept. And all others, beware. So I did some research on uh, the bull mastiff, which I liked a lot, but I didn't like the temperament that I saw in the dogs that um, were being shot in the AKC shows. They were really nothing like the dogs that, um, that were written about in these books. And when I looked at the dogs, they didn't even look the same. The dogs had a, more of a bully muzzle. They couldn't breathe as well. They didn't have the athletic build that uh, I saw in the pictures of the dogs at the turn of the century. And so I read everything I could, and I found some paperwork on uh, the bull master by a man named Mosley, who recreated who created that breed originally in his breeding program. So I structured mine very similar to that. And um, I used... Uh, like I said, different dogs and different breeds. And basically what I did was I used an English Mastiff to a Neapolitan, and then uh, pups off that were bred to an American Pit Bull Terrier. Now, you have to understand something, Sean. When I say an American Pit Bull Terrier, I'm not talking about the blue dogs that we see today. That dog didn't exist back then. 37 years ago, the blue dog was, it was non-existent. And so basically... What I used was the American Pit Bull Terrier, or what's referred to today as a game-bred American Pit Bull. And what you get from a dog like that is tenacity. Uh, they're very friendly with people. They love they love people. They had to. They were used uh, for bull baiting, and so people had to be able to pick them up and handle them and take them, you know, to another place or whatever, and uh, not worry about being bit. Uh, the Neapolitan Mastiff back then was known to have a very sharp temperament. They were a, they were a really hard dog, and uh, they were great with their people, but that was it. And the English Mastiff was uh, 
it was a good dog. It was a very, it was protective, but no prey drive really whatsoever. But a dog that was uh, real familiar with its borders. And I knew that with doing, with breeding a close or a uh, live breeding program, that the dogs were going to become smaller over a period of time without a, a wider gene flow. So two reasons why I, why I used the different breeds and why I recreated the breed three times. I wanted to keep size. I wanted to have a phenotype that I could continue with. And, uh, and, and, and so basically what I did was, um, I, uh, I bred the English to the Neo and that, that to the uh, American Pit Bull Terrier. And on the other side, I was using a bull master to an American Bulldog. And the American Bulldog, was a, the, they were specimens. I used some of the very best hog dogs that you could get. They weren't the showy type dogs. Again, they were more of the Scott type dogs. They were real showy dogs. The, the, they were real, uh, real flashy when they were catching pigs. But other than that, mm. just a bulldog. Right. And right. the old mastiffs that I used, I used um, uh, some really nice dogs, just super good dogs. And basically, what I was trying to do by doing the bulldog to the bull mastiff was I was trying to bring out more of the bulldog, the original bulldog used by Mosley in the bull mastiff program. And I felt like I did that. So the offspring from those two was bred to the offspring from the Mastiff Pitbull Cross, and that gave us F1 breeding stock. We sell a lot of dogs to law enforcement for their private lives, for their family. Okay. Uh, okay. We sell a lot of dogs to law enforcement. Uh, um, like I said, these are guardian companions, and um, so the people that want these dogs or people that understand what our society, where our society is heading. And, um, you know, they, you know, if a person's going to have a dog and they're going to have a pet, and they're going to have a, a dog, they're going to put time and energy into a lot of people want something in return. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a nice, nice deal to have, you know, it's kind of an extra uh, to have a real loving dog that's real loving and companionable, but will also get up and die for you at the moment's notice, you know? Um, so right now I sell dogs. My primary is law enforcement. I sell a lot to uh, people that have uh, a lot of deputy sheriffs buy dogs for me. I've sold dogs at DEA, FBI, and then I've sold quite a few dogs to celebrities. So um, people that have a reason you know, to want to have a nice big dog like this, um, there are the people. And so now what I'm finding is, you know, just John Q. Public. Uh, we go to a pet expo every year, and uh, we introduce the breed in many ways, but that's one of the ways we introduce the breed. And from that pet expo, I've had hundreds of people who are interested in the breed. And so I don't, probably hundreds or thousands, I don't sell dogs to just anybody with money. Um, I want to make sure that the person who's buying the dog from me understands what they're doing, what they're purchasing. And uh, mm -hmm. I want them to be aware of uh, the possibility of this dog, um, of the capabilities of the dog. And, and, and uh, so when I talk to people, a lot of times in my interview with them, they don't realize they're being interviewed, Sean. They say, do you have pups available? And I say, yeah. And they say, uh, well, do you have any males? And I said, are you looking for a male or a female? And the interview begins. And mm -hmm. when I begin to ask them why a female or why a male, and did, they, did you do your research? Did you read everything you could read? And so on and so forth. And then I answer all their unanswered questions. And then I just tell them point blank, you know, this is, this is a scenario that could possibly happen and uh, I let them know you know uh, this is not like any other dog you've ever had this is a dog that's comparable to a secret service agent he is ready and he's ready to go at the at the drop of the hat and as long as he's introduced properly and the person is responsible no problem everything beautiful but if 
I, I, I'm very com I'm very I'm very confident that these dogs are going into the right hands at this point because, you know, I'm uh, still watching over this breed, uh, myself like a guardian. When I see it going into everybody's home, um, whoever wants to have a nice dog that will take care of them and, and watch over them and their family. And, uh, and, and then let me say this too, Sean, I, um, I, um, normally breed dogs for a steady temperament and I don't care about color. That to me doesn't mean a thing. I'm looking for a dog that can move good and a dog that has an excellent temperament and really wants to love that family and love that master. Um, so if a person that, you know, when a person gets this breed, if they step up and that's what they are, perfect, mm -hmm. great fit. No, there's, uh, over in Europe, there's quite a few people breeding the dog. Oh. Eastern Europe, they're breeding them left and right. Uh, there's some breeders in Texas. There's a breeder in Florida. There's some breeders in New York. Um, there's quite a few people out here that are breeding that I've sold breeding pairs to. Okay. Okay. That are doing it right. Um, there's also people who, uh, you know, they're, they're fraudulent and they're breeding this breed to other breeds and saying that they're purebred and so on. But if the dogs aren't registered and they don't come down from my lineage in, in four or five generations, that is probably not a real animal. Mm -hmm. My, uh, my name on the paperwork is blue my kennel is blues man. Okay. And, uh, okay. So if it says Blues Man, Blues Man's, uh, you know, rocket ship or Blues Man's, uh, you know, big, big uh, raider or, or beast or whatever, then you know it's uh, one of my dogs are down from my lineage. And if it doesn't, then it's probably not one of my dogs. Registered with the, uh, with the uh, National Kennel Club. Uh, they're the same okay. country that first registered David Levette's dogs, the old English bulldog, and they also registered the American bulldog uh, for anyone else. So I wanted to go with a registry that would um, that were that was uh, more focused on working the dogs and not so focused on show dogs, because I didn't want this breed what happened to Bull Mastiff to happen to this breed. I want these dogs to be guardian companions, and I'd like that to, to continue to be the case, you know, for the next 100, 200 years. Right. So and whatever I, I can do to make that happen, I will. Great with kids. Dogs are great with kids, but it's really important to me that the people understand it's a big dog. And so because it's a big dog, you could step on a child and hurt it. You could step on a child's foot inadvertently and hurt the child. Uh, the other thing is, when, the, when a dog, when a big dog is sleeping, leave it alone. People want to get right in their face and wake them up. Like, you know, there's, there, it, it's almost like uh, one of the, uh, one of my friends uh, who's an actor, uh, you know, is famous. You know, he said it to me a hundred times. He said, you know, I said, common sense dictates. And he says, uh, common sense ain't common no more. And, you know, it's really too bad because, uh, you know, if a person just used common sense, they wouldn't have half the problems, half the accidents that happen with other breeds, with other dogs. You know, um, I've seen so many things happen with blue pit bulls and it gave them such a bad name. And if you look at, you know, situations and how they unfold, it's, it's the person's fault. It's the, it's the irresponsible person. You know, uh, there was a big dog, was I believe it was half Preston Canario and half uh, English Mastiff, and a lady up in Northern California on the dog was constantly uh, sicking the dog on the neighbor because she didn't like the neighbor. And she would, you know, say, watch, watch, watch. And one day the dog got away from her, and I guess it killed the neighbor, and that made all the newspapers, and that lady went to jail for life. Yeah. And that was a real scar on big breed and it wasn't the dog's fault it was the people's fault you know uh, that dog probably uh, was a good dog and in the right hands could have been a great dog a great family dog and protector but in the wrong hands you saw what happened yeah. 
Um, you know, dogs uh, figure out the pecking order in their family. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a friend who bought a dog for me, and uh, he had a pit bull female, and his pit bull was in the front yard, and his Ambolia was in the front yard. And uh, I asked him after the dog was about a year, I said, you know, how's your, how's your dog doing? Oh, she's good. She's good. And I said, she's quite a guardian. And he goes, no, no, not really. I said, well, what, what do you mean not really? And he said, well, my, my pit bull does the guarding and she just sits back on the porch and watch. And I said, well, that's the pecking order. She's, she's allowing that to happen because she's, she's respecting the, the pit bull. And he said, really? Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah. I said, you have a fence around your yard? And he goes, yeah, we have a big five-foot fence. And I said, okay, well, put the pit bull in the backyard, see what happens. A week later, he called me and said, people are crossing the street to walk past my house. That's I, I said, well, then your dog's doing what it was supposed to do. And <laughs> But that's a, that's a good example of how the dog respects in the home the uh, pecking order that's already existent when it comes into that family. But, but. Most of my dogs, you know, the, the standard for the breed was, uh, was written, like I said, 30 years ago. And, uh, and basically what we're looking for is uh, one to three from the octopole to the, uh, from the octopole in the, on the back of the head, uh, up to the, uh, up to the, uh, Stop. I want a one to three as far as the muzzle is concerned in size. The ear is a very similar ear to a blown massive. They can they can either be cropped or uncropped. Uh, if they're cropped, we prefer a uh, medium lobe, medium length, medium bell. And um, if a person wants the dog's ears cropped, I charge them what the vet charges me, and the vet gives me a pretty good price because I bring the vet quite a few dogs. So um, they can be either way. Uh, the body is supposed to be a very strong, great, good angulation, straight top line, and uh, strong, powerful neck, strong, powerful jaws. The feet are almost cat-like. For a big dog, they're not, you know, they're not, the toes are not supposed to be splayed. The dog is either. I want the dog feet to be out just a little bit to the right and to the left. And like I said, good angulation is real important to me uh, as far as the mm -hmm. spine is concerned. I don't think it's a good thing to have a dog uh, back end uh, higher than the front end. And uh, it doesn't seem to be able to, my dog seem to be able to move a lot better than bigger dogs. We had a situation once where a guy had a, um, Ambolio and another guy had brought his Jack Russell and they were throwing the ball and they were on a uh, a, uh, a handball court mm -hmm. and that Ambolio was getting the ball every time that Jack Russell was going for it but that Ambolio was getting the ball and uh, that speaks volume because Jack Russell's a good little dog and they're a good little right. you know, they'll, they're, cause most of the time the, uh, the, uh, um, the Jack Russell's going to get the ball because, you know, it's just like a bastard dog. But in that particular case, my friend Roy was amazed. He said, my God, Matthew was phenomenal. And he is. Great dog. He's a well-bred dog. And I had a litter of pups off him. They, everybody that got a pup off that dog, they're all impressed. They all love their dog. One of them is actually going to, uh, on a regular basis, a veteran that had uh, PTSD is taking it on a regular basis. Um, to the uh, to the VA, in on the meeting, all the guys are petting him. The dog is just loving it, and it's been doing this since it was nine months old. And it looks like that dog is probably going to turn out to be a great service dog. Sean, the Ambolio is, as far as intellect, is like the German Shepherd of the 60s. Mm -hmm. You can teach them anything in five minutes. They are so smart. And, and again, they, they don't have that high prey drive that will take them off their course. On a 1 to 10, it's about a 5. So it, it, it's just not through the roof like a Malinois or a Shepherd, you know, a DDR dog. You know, those type of dogs are better for attack work. These dogs are the dogs. And so they're much better for a family companion because 
that's their home. The other good thing about an Ambulio Mastiff, because of the way it's bred, if they get out, you'll find them on your porch. They don't want to go anywhere. That's their home, and they know it. Mm -hmm. I can. Uh, from time to time, I'll help uh, people that, you know, say, hey, I would really like my dog to learn to do this or that. I say, sure, no problem. Um, I can help them do that. But like I said, you can teach an Ambonio to do anything in five minutes. Uh, if, if a person, the biggest challenge that I think most dog breeders run into is getting people that want to spend the time to learn how to obedience train. That's seven small commands. And if a person takes the time to learn how to obedience train their dog, then they've opened up a, uh, they've opened up a, a, you know, the ability to communicate with their dog on another level. And once you're, once you are able to do that with your dog, everything else is cake. You know, a person thinks, well, I don't need to teach my dog to heal and to sit, to sit, stay, and down, stay, to lay down, to come to me and something. Those are things that I probably won't use, but it's not for that purpose. It's for the purpose of opening up the dog's mind and opening up the person's mind to see how the dog and the person relate to one another. And once that happens, the magic happens. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. the dog starts realizing, and, a, and an Ambolio is a very intelligent dog, so they realize real quick, man, this guy's communicating with me, and I want to do, I want to be with him wherever he is. I want to do whatever it takes. I want to, whatever makes him happy, that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. That's how these dogs are, you know, that's, basically what an Ambonio does. You know what? I don't, I don't breed a lot of litters. I, what I do is this, I only do a breeding when my breed, my, my litters are usually four to 10 pups. And so what I try to do is I try to, uh, to ensure that I have, um, four deposits before I do a breeding. So we're online, you know, social media and so on. And people are constantly saying, Hey, I want a pup. I want a pup. I want a pup. And, uh, once I've talked to them and I know that, you know, this might be a good person to own a dog, then uh, own an Ambolio, then I say, okay, well, you know, I need a deposit to know you're, you're, you're real. And, um, most people say no problem. And then I get a deposit and I make a hard file on them. And then, uh, once I've done that. Uh, four times, and I have four four uh, deposits. Then I'll do a breeding. Uh, the breedings that I do, I'm always breeding to make better dogs. So I only breed the best to the best, and um, I make sure that I'm out cross uh, four generations, whenever possible, so that it's a complete out cross. Uh, sometimes I'll breed tighter, depending on you know where we're at. I'll go from there, but uh, for the most part, that's what I try to do. And uh, in doing so, um, I've produced some really good dogs over the years. So that's how I do it. And then when the litter is born, um, like I said, it's usually four to four to ten pups. Then other people that are waiting in line at that point, I let them know that I'll take their deposit at that point, and I take their deposits and we go from there. I hold on to puppies. Um, no matter how old they are, I began their training so that when a person buys a pup from me, if they buy it at, at uh, eight weeks, then it's one price. And of course, the price becomes more as the dog gets older, where in most cases, people are just trying to, a lot of, lot of uh, backyard breeders, they're just trying to dump the dog for whatever price they can get if it gets older. But what I do is I begin putting uh, obedience training on the dog so that when a person gets a dog, the dog's already a turnkey obedience trained dog. And so I uh, charge according. Well, I have a kennel. Right. So my right. daily routine is to uh, get up in the morning and uh, I don't want to wake the neighborhood. So I don't start cleaning until seven. Uh, we live out in, I guess you can tell by the, by the background, we're a country. Mm -hmm. But I still have neighbors, you know, these are mostly 10 acre ranches, five, 10 acres, 20 and, and larger. Uh, basically what we 
what I do is I start off by cleaning and feeding. Uh, I have helper, but um, but I'm out there and I'm cleaning and feeding. And uh, I call that my get humble time. And uh, and so I'm picking up dog crap and, uh, you know, I'm doing what I do. And there's a lot you can learn from that about the dog. You know, you can tell whether your dog is how he's feeling or how she's feeling, depending on, you know, what the defecation looks like. I know what I feed, so, um, you know, I know what it's supposed to look like. And then uh, all my kennels get hosed down daily. Uh, waters get refilled. And, um, you know, each one of my dogs, uh, actually two by two, males and females, unless the bitch is in the heat, get put in an exercise yard. Exercise yard, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great big yard, uh, 80 by 80. And the dogs can run and jump and play, whatever. And so everybody gets time in the exercise yard uh, daily. And that's when we start doing it. And that's why I say my helper is able to do that. By 9 o'clock, I'm um, off and doing my other business. And uh, then I come back uh, later that day. My helper has been releasing dogs throughout the day and walking dogs. We bought this place especially for the kennel and for the ability to breed Ambonio Lathus. Uh, so we take the dogs back there and we let them run and, uh, we have a quad dogs run behind the quad. Some dogs run, <laughs> they go, they go back there and they have a good time. And, uh, then when I come home at night, check everybody again, clean everybody again. And some dogs get fed twice a day. Some dogs don't. Um, and then, uh, if I'm going to do a breeding, if I'm doing a breeding, then uh, if it's going to be an artificial insemination, then I will do the AI. I'll collect the male, and then I'll uh, inseminate the bitch. And then we have an area here at our kennel that's uh, designated for whelping. And um, so once a bitch has been bred, uh, obviously the date's written down and and how many how much the how much semen, how many cc's and so on. And then um, we start watching. And at four to five weeks, I can usually tell that the bitch is, you know, that she's due to have pups because uh, her nipples, the hair in the nipples begins to move away and the nipples begin to drop. And so there's a pretty good indication. If I want to uh, really know, then I can take them down to the vet and Dr. Butchko will, uh, he'll do a, 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 uh, sonogram and i said most of the time i can tell i've been breeding dogs for quite some time and you know i can look at a at a female and tell most of the time she's pregnant um actually the special diet my dogs are on right now comes from costco and uh okay. and basically uh, what i do is um all my dogs are on costco it's that purple bag and then uh -huh. you know there's uh i also use um uh, chicken, frozen chicken, and I throw frozen chicken in there. Sometimes I use canned food on top of that, and sometimes it's straight Costco food. During the winter, mm -hmm. I feed a little different than I do during the summer months. I feed a little heavier, and uh, I always want my dogs to look good. I check my dogs for their fat. I was taught by a old pit bull breeder years ago, uh, he told me if you put your finger next to the uh, breath bone and you push it in, you can feel how far it goes in. That'll give you a good indication of how much fat the dog has on it. You can also look to see if there's any bones showing on the, on the spine or on the rib. And you don't want any spine showing and you want maybe one rib uh, during the summer months. And during the winter, nothing. You want everything to look heavy and fat, chunky and so on. And of course, that's different with puppies. With puppies, I want them always to look good. I always want them to have milk fat on them. I feed my puppies um, w with their gruel. I feed them uh, goat milk, powdered goat milk, and powdered colostrum, and then I mix that with uh, with meat. Um, mm -hmm. so, and I make that gruel, and then the pups start getting bigger and bigger. And I like that milk fat that gets that's on the puppies. And um, 
if a pup has a problem with a stomach or something to that effect, you know, you don't have to worry about the puppy um, getting too sick because they've got, you know, three days worth of fat on them while you make mm -hmm. adjustments and, and, uh, and reworm and, you know, look for coccidia, giardia, you know, and so on. And um, so, you know, to a person who takes a puppy home, you know, those are things that, you know, you run to the vet with. Me, I take a fecal sample and put it on a slide and get it under the microscope and then figure out what's going on and then I treat them. Mm -hmm. uh, cool. Cool. And uh, very rarely do I have to go to the vet anymore, but when I do, I go to Dr. Butchko. Okay. Okay. And if you're in Southern California and you have a, a bulldog or a bull breed, you know who Dr. Butchko is. Okay. Well, the reason that I feed. Um, sometimes I feed twice a day, sometimes once a day, and it depends on the dog. If it's a big dog, it's twice a day. And the reason for that is because if you feed a big dog too much at once, it can get bloat or stomach torsion and, and die. If you feed the dog twice a day, it's not so heavy on the stomach and the chances of that happening are, are, are lessened. All the also, if you pull the food that, you know, uh, when a pup, when it, when a dog's a puppy, I, I put it out there and as long as there's more than one puppy there, they're going to keep eating until it's gone. Um, when a dog starts getting finicky and they leave their food in their bowl all day and you just pile it in there and, you know, you're, you're, you're really, um, uh, you're, you're opening your dog up to getting all kinds of diseases because flies can land on the food and all kinds of things can happen. So I like to feed my dogs on a schedule. I don't like to free feed. And um, I know a fellow that feeds a ton of food every three days, and he swears by it. He says that's the best thing and that that's how the wolf eats and so on. And, you know, I know with wild animals that is true. But I think with a domesticated dog, it's better to feed smaller meals and, and mm -hmm. do it more, you know, twice a day. Um, and that should be good. I know for my foot, I haven't had any real problem with bloat. And I know a lot of people with large breeds, they lose a lot of good dogs to bloat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I want to shout out to, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate you, uh, your show and, and you know what you're doing, Sean. I think that's wonderful that you're educating people. You're getting people out there, you're getting the word out there, and you're educating people to these other breeds. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, 